In Einstein's general theory of relativity, the gravitational redshift is the phenomenon that clocks in a gravitational field tick slower when observed by a distant observer. More specifically the term refers to the shift of wavelength of a photon to longer wavelength the red side in an optical spectrum when observed from a point in a lower gravitational field. In the latter case the clock is the frequency of the photon and a lower frequency is the same as a longer, redder, wavelength. The gravitational redshift is a simple consequence of Einstein's equivalence principle all bodies fall with the same acceleration independent of their composition and was found by Einstein eight years before the full theory of relativity. Observing the gravitational redshift in the solar system is one of the classical tests of general relativity. Gravitational redshifts are an important effect in satellite-based navigation systems such as GPS. If the effects of general relativity were not taken into account, such systems would not work at all. Topic. Prediction by the equivalence principle and general relativity Einstein's theory of general relativity incorporates the equivalence principle, which can be stated in various different ways. One such statement is that gravitational effects are locally undetectable for a free-falling observer. Therefore, in a laboratory experiment at the surface of the Earth, all gravitational effects should be equivalent to the effects that would have been observed if the laboratory had been accelerating through outer space at g. One consequence is a gravitational Doppler effect. If a light pulse is emitted at the floor of the laboratory, then a free-falling observer says that by the time it reaches the ceiling, the ceiling has accelerated away from it, and therefore when observed by a detector fixed to the ceiling, it will be observed to have been Doppler shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. This shift, which the free-falling observer considers to be a kinematical Doppler shift, is thought of by the laboratory observer as a gravitational redshift. Such an effect was verified in the 1959 Pound-Rebka experiment. In a case such as this, where the gravitational field is uniform, the change in wavelength is given by delta lambda lambda approximately equals g delta y C two display style frac delta lambda lambda approximately frac g delta y c caret two where delta y display style delta y is the change in height. Since this prediction arises directly from the equivalence principle, it does not require any of the mathematical apparatus of general relativity, and its verification does not specifically support general relativity over any other theory that incorporates the equivalence principle. When the field is not uniform, the simplest and most useful case to consider is that of a spherically symmetric field. By Birkhoff's theorem, such a field is described in general relativity by the Schwarzschild metric. D tau 2 equals 1 minus r s r d t 2 plus display style d tau caret 2 equals 1 r underscore s r d t caret 2 plus l dots where d tau display style d tau is the clock time of an observer at distance r from the center d t display style dt is the time measured by an observer at infinity r s display style r underscore s is the schwarzschild radius 2 g m c 2 display style 2 g m c caret 2 represents terms that vanish if the observer is at rest g display style g is newton's gravitational constant m display style m the mass of the gravitating body and c display style c the speed of light the result is that frequencies and wavelengths are shifted according to the ratio lambda infinity Lambda e equals one minus r 
s r e minus 1 2 display style frac lambda underscore in at lambda underscore e equals 1 r underscore s r underscore e caret minus 1 half where lambda infinity display style lambda underscore in at is the wavelength of the light as measured by the observer at infinity lambda e display style lambda underscore e is the wavelength measured at the source of emission and r e display style r underscore e radius at which the photon is emitted this can be related to the redshift parameter conventionally defined as z equals lambda infinity lambda e minus 1 Display style z equals lambda underscore in a t lambda underscore e minus one. In the case where neither the emitter nor the observer is at infinity, the transitivity of Doppler shifts allows us to generalize the result to lambda one lambda two equals one minus r s r one one minus r s r 2 1 2 display style lambda underscore 1 lambda underscore 2 equals 1 r underscore s r underscore 1 1 r underscore s r underscore 2 caret 1 half the redshift formula for the frequency nu equals c lambda Display style new equals c lambda is new o new e equals lambda e lambda o display style new underscore o new underscore e equals lambda underscore e lambda underscore o when r one minus r Two display style r underscore one r underscore two is small. These results are consistent with the equation given above based on the equivalence principle. For an object compact enough to have an event horizon, the redshift is not defined for photons emitted inside the Schwarzschild radius, both because signals cannot escape from inside the horizon and because an object such as the emitter cannot be stationary inside the horizon, as was assumed above. Therefore, this formula only applies when R e display style R underscore e is larger than R s display style R underscore s. When the photon is emitted at a distance equal to the Schwarzschild radius, the redshift will be infinitely large, and it will not escape to any finite distance from the Schwarzschild sphere. When the photon is emitted at an infinitely large distance, there is no redshift. In the Newtonian limit, i.e., when r e display style r underscore e is sufficiently large compared to the Schwarzschild radius, r s display style r underscore s, the redshift can be approximated as z approximately equals. 1 2 r s r e equals g m c 2 r e display style z approximately frac 1 2 frac r underscore s r underscore e equals frac g m c caret 2 r underscore e Topic. Experimental verification Topic. Initial observations of gravitational redshift of white dwarf stars A number of experimenters initially claimed to have identified the effect using astronomical measurements, and the effect was considered to have been finally identified in the spectral lines of the star Sirius B by W.S. Adams in 1925. 
However, measurements by atoms have been criticized as being too low and these observations are now considered to be measurements of spectra that are unusable because of scattered light from the primary. Sirius A the first accurate measurement of the gravitational redshift of a white dwarf was done by Popper in 1954, measuring a 21 km sec gravitational redshift of 40 Eridani B the redshift of Sirius B was finally measured by Greenstein et al in 1971, obtaining the value for the gravitational redshift of 89 plus or minus 19 km, sec, with more accurate measurements by the Hubble Space Telescope, showing 80.4 plus or minus 4.8 km, sec. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Terrestrial tests. The effect is now considered to have been definitively verified by the experiments of Pound, Rebka, and Snyder between 1959 and 1965. The pound rebka experiment of 1959 measured the gravitational redshift in spectral lines using a terrestrial 57 Fe gamma source over a vertical height of 22.5 meters. Using measurements of the change in wavelength of gamma ray photons generated with the Mossbauer effect, which generates radiation with a very narrow line width. The accuracy of the gamma ray measurements was typically 1%. An improved experiment was done by Pound and Snyder in 1965, with an accuracy better than the 1% level. A very accurate gravitational redshift experiment was performed in 1976, where a hydrogen maser clock on a rocket was launched to a height of 10,000 km, and its rate compared with an identical clock on the ground. It tested the gravitational redshift to 0.007%. Later tests can be done with the Global Positioning System GPS, which must account for the gravitational redshift in its timing system, and physicists have analyzed timing data from the GPS to confirm other tests. When the first satellite was launched, it showed the predicted shift of 38 microseconds per day. This rate of the discrepancy is sufficient to substantially impair the function of GPS within hours if not accounted for. An excellent account of the role played by general relativity in the design of GPS can be found in Ashby 2003. Topic: <laughs> Later astronomical measurements. James W. Brault, a graduate student of Robert Dick at Princeton University, measured the gravitational redshift of the sun using optical methods in 1962. In 2011 the group of Roddick Wojtek of the Niels Bohr Institute at the University of Copenhagen collected data from 8,000 galaxy clusters and found that the light coming from the cluster centers tended to be red shifted compared to the cluster edges, confirming the energy loss due to gravity. Other precision tests of general relativity, not discussed here, are the Gravity Probe A satellite, launched in 1976, which showed gravity and velocity affect the ability to synchronize the rates of clocks orbiting a central mass, the Haffel Keating experiment experiment, which used atomic clocks in circumnavigating aircraft to test general relativity and special relativity together, and the forthcoming satellite test of the equivalence principle. In 2018, the VLT had successfully observed the gravitational redshift and the first successful test has been performed by the Galactic Center team at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics Early historical development of the theory The gravitational weakening of light from high gravity stars was predicted by John Mitchell in 1783 and Pierre Simon Laplace in 1796, using Isaac Newton's concept of light corpuscles see, emission theory, and who predicted that some stars would have a gravity so strong that light would not be able to escape. The effect of gravity on light was then explored by Johann Georg von Soldner 1801, who calculated the amount of deflection of a light ray by the Sun, arriving at the Newtonian answer which is half the value predicted by general relativity. All of this early work assumed that light could slow down and fall, which was inconsistent with the modern understanding of light waves. Once it became accepted that light was an electromagnetic wave, it was clear that the frequency of light should not change from place to place, since waves from a source with a fixed frequency keep the same frequency everywhere. One way around this conclusion would be if time itself were altered. If clocks at different points had different rates. This was precisely Einstein's conclusion in 1911. He considered an accelerating box, and noted that according to the special theory of relativity, the clock rate at the bottom of the box was slower than the clock rate at the top. Nowadays, this can be easily shown in accelerated coordinates. 
The metric tensor in units where the speed of light is 1 is d s 2 equals minus r 2 d t 2 plus d r 2 display style ds caret 2 equals r caret 2 dt caret 2 plus dr caret 2 and for an observer at a constant value of r the rate at which a clock ticks r r is the square root of the time coefficient r r equals r the acceleration at position r is equal to the curvature of the hyperbola at fixed r and like the curvature of the nested circles in polar coordinates it is equal to 1 r so at a fixed value of g, the fractional rate of change of the clock rate, the percentage change in the ticking at the top of an accelerating box versus at the bottom, is r r plus d r minus r r r equals d r r equals g d r display style r r plus d r r r over r equals doctor over r equals g d r the rate is faster at larger values of r away from the apparent direction of acceleration the rate is zero at r equals zero which is the location of the acceleration horizon Using the equivalence principle, Einstein concluded that the same thing holds in any gravitational field, that the rate of clocks r at different heights was altered according to the gravitational field g. When g is slowly varying, it gives the fractional rate of change of the ticking rate. If the ticking rate is everywhere almost this same, the fractional rate of change is the same as the absolute rate of change, so that d r d x equals G equals minus D V D X display style doctor over DX equals G equals D V over DX. Since the rate of clocks and the gravitational potential have the same derivative, they are the same up to a constant. The constant is chosen to make the clock rate at infinity equal to one. Since the gravitational potential is zero at infinity. R x equals one minus v x c two display style R x equals one v x over c caret two, where the speed of light has been restored to make the gravitational potential dimensionless. The coefficient of the d t two display style dt caret 2 in the metric tensor as the square of the clock rate which for small values of the potential is given by keeping only the linear term r 2 equals 1 minus 2 v display style r caret 2 equals 1 to 2 volts and the full metric tensor is d s 2 equals minus 1 minus 2 v r c 2 c 2 d t 2 plus d x 2 plus d y 2 plus D Z two display style ds caret two equals left one two volts r over c caret two right c caret two dt caret two plus dx caret two plus di caret two plus dz caret two, where again the c's have been restored. This expression is correct in the full theory of general relativity, to lowest order in the gravitational field, and ignoring the variation of the space-space and space-time components of the metric tensor, which only affect fast-moving objects. Using this approximation, Einstein reproduced the incorrect Newtonian value for the deflection of light in 1909. But since a light beam is a fast-moving object, the space-space components contribute too. 
After constructing the full theory of general relativity in 1916, Einstein solved for the space space components in a post Newtonian approximation and calculated the correct amount of light deflection, double the Newtonian value. Einstein's prediction was confirmed by many experiments, starting with Arthur Eddington's 1919 solar eclipse expedition. The changing rates of clocks allowed Einstein to conclude that light waves change frequency as they move, and the frequency-energy relationship for photons allowed him to see that this was best interpreted as the effect of the gravitational field on the mass energy of the photon. To calculate the changes in frequency in a nearly static gravitational field, only the time component of the metric tensor is important, and the lowest order approximation is accurate enough for ordinary stars and planets, which are much bigger than their Schwarzschild radius. Topic. See also Tests of general relativity Equivalence principle Gravitational time dilation Redshift Very large telescope Topic. Notes Topic. Primary sources Mitchell, John On the means of discovering the distance, magnitude etc. of the fixed stars. Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, 74-35-57. doi, 10.1098, rstl.1784.0008, Laplace, Pierre Simon The System of the World, English translation 1809, 2. London, Richard Phillips. pp. 366-368, Soldner, Johann Georg von 1804. On the deflection of a light ray from its rectilinear motion, by the attraction of a celestial body at which it nearly passes by. Berliner Astronomisches Jahrbuch, 161-172, Albert Einstein. Relativity, the special and general theory. At Project Gutenberg. Pound, R. V., Rebka, G. A., Jr. 1959. Gravitational Red Shift in Nuclear Resonance. Phys. Rev. Let. 3 439 441. Bibcode, 1959 PHRVL. 0.3439 p. doi, 10.1103, PhysRevlet.3.439. Pound, R. V., Snyder, J. L. Effect of Gravity on Gamma Radiation. Phys. Rev. B. 140-788-803. Bibcode, 1965 PHRV, 0 .140, 788p. doi, 10.1103, Phys. B. 788. Pound, R. V. Weighing Photons. 2000. Classical and Quantum Gravity, 17-2303-2311. Bibcode, 2000CQGRA, 17 2303p. doi, 10.1088-0264-9381, 17 December 301. References Misner, Charles W. Thorne, Kip S. Wheeler, John Archibald, the 15th of September 1973. Gravitation. San Francisco, W. H. Freeman. ISBN 978-0-7167-0344-0.